Here in this place, God's light is shining. Now at this time, we are called to be God's justice. Within this community, we are Christ's body here on earth. Good morning and welcome to our beautiful Sunday service here in Renton United Methodist Church. We are glad that you make it here in person and welcome for those who will be watching online later on. All are welcome. My name is Eliza Folau. I'm a local pastor. I'm glad to be here in the house of God and in your presence in this morning. Let's stand for the call of worship. <clears throat> we are called into this place. We are called into this body. We are called into the kingdom of God. Now we invite Carol Smith for him of breaks. Good morning. Good morning. All verses, um, page 66. Praise my soul, the King of heaven. Good morning. I'm Kent McClary. Welcome to the, our church, the Renton, First, the Renton United Methodist Church. Please join me in the opening prayer, which is in your program. God of our yesterdays and our tomorrows, nothing is permanent but your love. Nothing is certain except your presence. When the winds of life change, 
and the mountaintop experience gives way to the stark reality of the valley, remind us that you are with us still. If we should be tempted or pressured to compromise our beliefs, help us to hold fast to your teachings. Make us so certain of who you are and of your good work in our lives that we may live before others as those who truly belong to Christ. Amen. Our first reading this morning is on page 161 in the Red Bible in your pews, if you care to read along. This is from the letter of Paul to the Romans. This is verse uh, 12, uh, pardon me, this is uh, Romans 12, 1 through 8. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, on the basis of God's mercy, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship. Do not be conformed to this age. In our Bible, in the pews says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body, we have many members, and not all the members have the same function. So we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually, we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the encourager in encouragement, the giver in sincerity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.
of one of my women. And I'm safe within your arms, Lord. I've become shot again. I've come back to the source of love where he Sometimes the words are so true, and they touch us in such a deep place, and uh, and that is that is the gift of the spirit. And so thank you for sharing that, and then finding your way back. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, I'm not seeing any children here today. Are are there children? Well, now I'm not going to make you come down like Pastor Melvin, because I'm gonna. I want to see you out there and I want to see all of you but I want you to look at each other as well um, and so this is a this is an answer kind of thing I want you to I want you to respond okay so what do you need to clap what do you have to have to clap hands what do you have to have to see what do you have to have to run what do you have to have to hear what do you have to have to speak mouth and the Apostle Paul in his wisdom um, compared our human bodies to the body of Christ and says that you know what would it be like if we were all an eye and a hand you know we couldn't hear anything we couldn't go any place and um, and we couldn't say anything right and so I, I just want to uh, show you how the body of Christ exists here so everybody who is, is or has been a teacher, whether it's in the schools or in the Sunday school, raise your hand. Look at all the teachers. Oh my goodness, look at all the teachers. How many of you have been a leader in the church of a committee or a something? How many of you decorate the church and keep it beautiful? Yeah, yeah. Um, how many of you um, uh, put money in the offering plate and keep it going, keep the church going? Ah, thank you. Thank you, every one of you. Uh, how many of you preach? I knew there had to be one I could raise my hand on. Uh, how many of you garden? Ah, oh, all, that, all that produce out there. Um, how many of you are encouragers? Now, I better see every one of the seekers' hands up. Yeah, yeah, encouragers. How many of you are um, add to the musical program of this church? Thank you, thank you. Um, am I? Oh, the finance people. How many of you know about finance and help this church with finances and with property? There you go. Hi. <laughs> I knew you were out there. Thank you, because without you, you know. Um, let's see. What am, am I for? Am I missing something? Um, hmm. I think that's that's probably pretty good for now. How many of you? Who? Chore and chortle. How many of you? Thank you. How many of you fix things around the church and keep this building going? Only Dave? What? Oh, there, there's Chor and Chortle. How many of you do tech and, and make this possible for us to hear and to see on online? 
This is the body of Christ, and together, together we are the body of Christ. And when some of us are missing, or when you're missing, there is a giant hole. And, um, and that's a day that we don't see, or maybe we don't hear, or maybe we don't um, have uh, some other gift. So, body of Christ, blessings on you. Amen. Please join me in the next gospel reading. This is page 18 in the New Testament in your Red Bibles, in the pew. We will read from Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed to this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Amen. Amen. Who do we follow? Today in the gospel, we come across a question of identity, a question to identify who we are in our faith journey. If we want to identify a person, we may ask to see the driver license, ID card. And most of us here today, we have some kind of identification card or some kind of documentation that can help explain who we are. Nowadays, we almost can't leave the house without it, regardless where we go. Even if you just take a walk, go hiking, go for a bicycle ride, it's almost we carry our cell phone and some kind of identification. Sometimes, we use our business cards to let people know who we are or what we do. Something in a group or faith community like us, United Methodist Church, we have the cross and the flame to identify our denomination and what we believe. Our denomination has used the symbol since the founding in 1968. The red flame symbolized the color of Pentecost and the working of the Holy Spirit and the cross represent Christ. That sign identifies who we are as United Methodists. From the beginning, the Gospel of Matthew drew us with the good news the announcement of Emmanuel, God with us, at the birth of Jesus. Throughout Jesus' ministry, people would ask, who is this man or who is this person? Very common sense, especially when Jesus repeated doing things out of the ordinary. He 
he turned the impossible events or circumstances into hope and life. Even John the Baptist, when he was in prison because he condemned the king Herod Antipas for divorcing his wife and marrying his half-brother's wife, Philip, John sent out messengers to ask Jesus if he was the one, if he was the one. Are you the one who is to come or are we waiting for another? Who do we follow? Jesus replied and told the messengers, go back and tell John and report what you see and what you hear. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the deaf hear, even the leper are healed. The dead are raised and the good news is preached to the poor. These are Jesus' messages to describe himself to John and the messengers. Today's gospel is one of the climax passage of the gospel of Matthew regarding the ministry of Jesus. Jesus asks his disciples questions what he expects for some honest answer. We know that the disciples have been with Jesus for many years now, perhaps three. It is the type of question that will impact the way they interact with each other and perhaps for us as well. First Matthew told us the location of this conversation that took place. It is at Caesarea Philippi. This place is about 20 miles north of the Dead Sea, the Sea of Galilee. Earlier in Jesus' time, Caesarea Philippi has been the site of a cultic center for worshiping for pagan gods. They worship God's power for fertility and for rain. In the Hellenistic period, the Gentiles people in this area, they worship another deity called Pan in this very location, Caesarea Philippi. It is known in the region for bacon lifestyle and exercising bacon worship. After Herod the Great invaded the area, he built a temple there and renamed the area after Caesar Augustus. When Herod the Great died, his son Philip ruled the area and he renamed it after Tiberius Caesar and himself, Philip, now known as Caesarea Philippi. Matthew took an interest in naming this place. It shows a significant scene in a setting identified with pagan religious worshipers. It is an area where Jews and Bacons live together. So Cephas, the Jewish scholar and historian, recorded that when the Romans invaded Jerusalem, they took the Jews to Caesarea Philippi and throw them to wild animals. So this place has a long history associated with Bacon worshiper and Jewish historical events. It is very interesting location and a site where Jesus chose to have this conversation with his disciples. Now Jesus took a poll by asking his disciples, what about some public opinion? What do they say about me? Who do people say that the son of man is? The disciple answered, as we heard the scripture read, the people said, maybe you are John the Baptist. At this time, John was just beheaded. Maybe you are Elijah. Maybe you are Jeremiah or or one of the prophets. We notice Jesus call for identified himself as the son of man. Throughout the gospel of Matthew, the phrase son of man, is only used by Jesus to identify himself. 
It is an expression of humility. He identified with us, with his dual nature, his human nature and his divine nature. Now the disciples answer the public toll. When Jesus turned to them again and said, but who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? It is an intent, instant, direct, and personal question. Who do you say that I am? As believers and followers of Jesus, we can face the same question. Who do we say who Jesus is? Who do we follow? It is a, a question that we can look at and answer individually, but also we can look at it as a community of faith. Jesus wondered aloud in his thinking about the crowds, what they might say about him. But more importantly, what the disciples thought. It's another way of asking why we are following Jesus. Why do they follow Jesus? It is a question, why did they leave everything that they know and follow Jesus? And the question for us, it may be wor worthwhile to ask a similar question. Why are we choosing to follow this man from Galilee? Peter gets it right. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Peter identifies Jesus as the Messiah and the son of the living God. Peter and then the other disciples witness and experience Jesus' words in action. They testify that Jesus is the one, a human being, yet he displayed a divine character. Peter and the disciples had been with Jesus from day one of his earthly ministry. Jesus replied, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hate will not overcome it. Only in the book of Matthew, among the, the gospels, call our attention to this rock. I will build my church Jesus said, in other words, in a similar place like Caesarea Philippi, God will build a gathering of believers. The disciples understand the teaching of Jesus. The master and the disciples are bound together in identity. This is the first time the word church is used in the gospel and link with the kingdom. Church as the community of disciples and the kingdom of God are ultimately bound in Matthew's conception of Jesus' mission. From, from the point on, from this point on of the story of the book of Matthew, the story links to Jesus' passion, death, and resurrection. We know that Matthew chapter 28 is the great commission the disciples or the representative of this new faith community is to go in Jesus' name and make disciples of all nations. That is the central mission of the faith community. Who do we follow? This community comes with the promise of a rich gift. The keys to the kingdom of God are here and now and will continue for eternity. It is the invitation and mission for us believers to exercise the power of forgiveness. It is for us to continue call and our call and responsibility as believers, as Jesus' disciples, to do the same, to go and make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world.
Paul's letter to the Romans listed the character characteristics of disciples or follower of Jesus. It is about a presentation of how to live as a disciple, a living sacrifice, a life dedicated to the service of God, a life committed to God's will, a life lived in faith and lived out in faithfulness. One of the, the strengths of John Wesley ministry during his time at Oxford University, he started a class meeting. And in this weekly meeting, a question is asked to each of the members in the meeting. And, and the question is, how is your soul? It is a quest for personal growth, a sense of accountability, and to help to bear one another's burden, and also to speak to one another in truth and in love. Questioning our faith is a tool to, to clarify our path so that we can focus on the one we should follow, Jesus, who is the Messiah and the Son of the living God. Amen. Now is our hymn of dedication. Hymn number 2164, Sanctuary. We're going to run through this um, two times, okay? Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we are so grateful for your mercy and your grace. Every day you display the magnitude of your love through diversity and variation of your creation. Every day is new, not one it's the same. Your word is like the morning dew. It brings us hope, life, and joy. No matter who we are and where we lived, your loving hands can touch us. Yes, even to the end of the earth, you are there. Oh Lord, we come before you and pour out our worries, our anxieties, and fears. We pray for your peace that passes all worldly understanding. We call upon you to give us peace as we mourn those who lost their lives and properties in the wildfire in our state 
in other places. Lord, let us trust in your comfort. Let us trust in your love because we know we are blessed. Lord, we pray for the gun violence in our state and in our nation that spreads like wildfire. Your word told us that the devil comes to steal, kill, and to destroy. But you have come to give us life and for us to have it to the fullest. We lift up those in this congregation who are sick or hurt in any way. Give them peace and strength to face the situations. We continue to lift up Bill for continued healing and comfort. Lord, we heard your question for us today. Let us answer truthfully. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, our Lord and Savior. May these words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus, who taught his disciples how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now is our offering moment. Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Tom Jenkins, and Pastor Michelle thought it would be really swell if I were to come up and uh, say something about how much you've been missing out by not singing in choirs. Um, Servista wasn't supposed to be here, or else, you know, you could come up here and do this. I don't know. But perhaps I can give you a little idea of the choirs that I have sung in and those that you have missed out upon. I started singing in high school. Uh, we had a, it was a huge choir. It was a talented choir. Uh, we even sang for Gal Governor Albert D. Rosalini, and that was, we thought, we thought that that was cool. Um, yeah, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> I did. Um, that's what I was going to say. Um, we had some basso profundos that were really, really kind of exciting. They were just one really rumbled. One of them, his name is Bob Bingham, a high school classmate of mine. You probably have seen because he sang Caiaphas in Jesus Christ Superstar, the big guy with a big hat and that kind of stuff. Yeah, but. That was in high school. So about 10 years later, I mean, after military and university and Mary and our daughter, Mary and I joined the Boeing Choir um, and sang in the Boeing Choir for about 10 or 11 years. And that was a great choir. We had, we had our tuxedos, we had our blue gowns on the women and it was wonderful. And we sang everywhere. We sang at Wesley Gardens a lot. I, th I think our choir director's wife was the di head dietitian or something like that. So we were down there a lot. I, I can remember singing for uh, Dick Clark Sr., who many of you uh, more experienced folks may remember. Um, we, 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 we toured a bit. We, went, we sang at the, uh, at the high tea at the Empress Hotel in Victoria. But we did, we did travel more than that. We, went to, we sang in Germany and in France. We toured over there, and that was wonderful. Um, yeah, basically we were singing in cathedrals and churches all across Germany and France. But uh, our love of singing in that choir was such that um, one time we showed up in our tuxedos and our gowns at a location, I've long since forgotten where it was, over in Seattle, 
and nobody was there. So we, stood, we said, well, we came to sing. We're going to sing for a custodial guy came in, and he sat down, and we put on a full concert, a full concert in our tuxedos and gowns, and, and sang to one person. Well, that was really kind of fun. So then, a couple of years after leaving the Boeing Choir, since I was already kind of humming along with Dixon Long and when, when the choir was going on, I, I don't remember exactly how, it was a while before we, Mary and I joined the choir here, but it was in the, either the late, very late 80s or the, or the er, very early 90s. I, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I don't remember those things. I'd have to ask my wife. <laughs> I mean, in all of those choirs, and this one, we sang fun songs like spirituals that always kind of get you going. We sang songs that would touch your very soul and grab a hold and they were emotional. We even sang songs that Stan Warren, whom many of you may remember, would declare the music must have been acquired in a fire sale. He was, he, was, uh, he was pretty vocal about what he would say. So the whole point is to stay tuned. Choir's starting up now that summer's winding down. So I look forward to seeing you in choir or in the junior choir if you prefer as we uh, sing our praises to the Lord. Okay. for communion, um, I'm wondering if you would help me to thank Pastor Alisa for the Sundays that she's been with us and uh, for her preaching. Would you thank her with me? And, um, and Melvin, where did Melvin go? How did he, how did he disappear? All right. Well, we were going to thank him too, but we'll thank him next week. Um, and then to, uh, to remind you that next Sunday is Camp Sunday. We're going to be singing camp songs. We're going to have faith talks. We're going to have s'mores afterwards. And so come dressed for camp. All right. I'm going to put this down for a second. Come to this table to meet the living God, God indescribable and beyond our imagining, yet closer than our own breathing. Come to this table to meet the risen Christ, flesh of our flesh, bone of our bone, God with us, embodied in our living. Come to this table to meet the life-giving spirit, in interpreting our search for truth and justice, breathing into us renewing power. Come to find, to meet, to hold the living, loving God made new for us in bread and wine. Our loving God, we give you thanks for all the gifts that you have given us. And especially we thank you for the gift of Christ Jesus, our Lord. And we remember that on a night when he broke bread with friends, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. 
This is my body, broken for you. At the end of the meal, he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this cup, all of you. This is the cup of new life, my life, poured out for you, poured into you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you, whenever you drink this, remember me. And so, oh God, we do remember these gifts. And we ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on those of us who are gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them for us nourishment for the journey. Make them for our community a symbol of hope and new life. And may we remember you every time we break bread, whether it's in our church or whether it's at our tables. Every time we break bread, we remember you. We thank you that we belong to you and to it, we belong to one another. In Christ's name, amen. table is set. The invitation is Christ's. All are welcome at this table. All are accepted. All belong. All are loved. Come at Christ's invitation and dine. Got a little rhythm to it, so...
we'll do our best, right? <laughs> I should explain a little bit. Um, my emotions are quite raw today. We had um, a mama cat that gave birth three weeks ago to seven babies and she got hit by a car and died Thursday night. So it's been tough with the grandsons at home and you know, they're all missing their mom and all those baby kittens. So we're bottle feeding them and they're doing better today, a lot better. So I think we're gonna be um, really good surrogate moms <laughs> for these babies and they all have homes. So um, it's just been a tough week. So anyway, let's celebrate. Yes. Wonderful mama cat. Please stand. I'm gonna try to handle all this here. There we go. All right, Sabrina. <laughs> Blessed are you, children of God. We seek to be God's blessing in the world. Beloved are you, children of God. We go forth with God's love and grace. Amen. <laughs> 